Hello friends, and welcome to my new video in which I will tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is chaos caused by a simple request to turn down the volume. This past Sunday, I was supposed to be out hunting for the most of the day, but my wife invited some friends over so they and their kids could make gingerbread houses. I had returned for lunch and to assist her in setting up before heading out once more. My 23-year-old stepson arrived as I was making my way back out the door, about 20 minutes after everyone else had arrived. He doesn't reside with us, and we were unaware of his arrival. He appeared out of nowhere. But since he is, was, welcome, this is not an issue. A few minor but important details. My spouse and I are quiet individuals. Although you don't have to strain to hear us, you must be close to us during the conversation for us to be audible. On the other hand, my stepson is so loud, even at normal volume, that you can hear his conversation across the house and still want to bury your face in a pillow. No, I'm not overstating things. Anyway, my wife and our visitor are seated at the table when he enters, talking so loudly that our ears ache from the sheer volume. She requested that he be quiet, she really wanted to hear what he said, but was unable to do so because he is too loud, especially since we are in pain. It is also impolite. He snaps, hurries, or stomps out of the space. After a few minutes, my wife asked me to go see what his problem is, since I was just a bystander throughout all of this. Thus, I do. Without delay, he starts acting aggressively, screaming and swearing while claiming that we are discriminating against him by asking him to speak quiver and that his loud speech is due to his deafness. FYI, I paraphrased that. I tell him to get out if he won't stop acting agitated. Here, my wide enters to inquire about what's going on and requests that he either go or calm down because she has guests over and feels awkward. Not the best idea. Stronger, aggressive tones. He finally takes hold of my beard. I shoved him out of my face. He snatches my hair and proceeds to strike me. We are currently fighting and shoving each other around in my son's room. I'm trying to control our movements to prevent any serious damage to my son's room and my house, while my wife is screaming for us both to stop. The two giants, who are both well over six feet tall, are pulling my hair, which is longer than my shoulders, and punching me in the head. The dogs are going crazy, attempting to figure out who to attack and what's going on. He finally gives up. I took his bag containing his Xbox and headed out the door to throw it and him out of my home. He tackles from behind and smashes through his mother and out the door. We're currently battling over a glass table, chairs, grill, and other objects on the backyard patio with a pallet bar. Once more, I'm not as concerned with fighting him as I am with attempting to limit the damage to my house. In the end, I submitted him with a chokehold. He taps out when he realizes he can't escape. I release him because I believe he has calmed down. Additional insults, more terrified. He slaps me, so I give him a single right-handed cross after giving him a direct look. We're far enough away from my possessions that I don't have to worry about them as much now that I'm over him. More terrified. More outbursts. Speaking about seeing a doctor, he gave me a note that said, verbatim, he's deaf and I'll have to pay him for being mean to a deaf person. He has let my dogs run loose while everything is going on outside. In the dead of hunting season, two brown dogs in the middle of the woods. We live in the woods bordering farms. It's also the second day of gun season. At last, he departs. I gather myself and grab leashes to head back to my dogs. However, this is not the end. It seems he located and brought back the dogs while I was searching for them. Not before scolding my wife for not taking better care of the dogs, though. Since I left, I'm not really sure what happened here. However, I was informed that he was attempting to break into the house. My spouse shut the front door. My daughter hurried to close the rear entrance, which he attempted to break through. It's a glass sliding door. Remember that we still have visitors along with their children. I assume that's why he left again, then. He now leaves in a company van, by the way, and passes me and my neighbor, who has offered to assist me in my search for my dogs. However, that also can't be the conclusion. To get at me even more, he flips the van into reverse and attempts to bait me into a brawl. I turn to leave, rinse and repeat five five times, and starts to insult my neighbor as well. 
She's arguing and swearing at him now. We continue to walk. He gets tired, and although it's not what he says, calls me a sissy. He then speeds off and says he left me a surprise. He crashed his car a week before Thanksgiving, so he spent all of this time in the company work van. And now he's telling my other stepson that I threw his Xbox outside the house. That's the only reason he lost it. Lie. Why did I feel surprised? As he was leaving the dogs, he caused damage to my workshop. Actually, he just threw everything on the tables onto the ground in a fit of rage. Still, though, why are there no police? First off, I'm of the old school belief that getting into a fist fight doesn't always mean you should go to jail. I lean more toward anarchism combined with law enforcement. Two, he departed before the send button was actually pressed, even though 911 was on the dial. Three, he is on probation and 10 years are automatically imposed for any infraction. Although the circumstances were unfortunate, I'm not sure I want him to spend 10 years in prison for a fist fight. He has a one-year-old son, so I'll weigh in on both sides of the jail debate, since I'm sure you'll inquire. His actions around the age of 17 resulted in his serving 1821 days in jail, which is why he is on probation. Breaking into cars and committing small-time thefts in several counties, followed by serving time for at least a year in each county. He is, once more, my wife's son. Even though he needs to face consequences, ten years seems excessive. We don't communicate right now, but that will undoubtedly change in the future. Though we both live and let live, my wife is on my side. In other words, we simply have a tendency to hold on to our anger for extended periods of time. Additionally, in an effort to respond to some inquiries ahead of time, I didn't put up much of a fight, because yes, he was frequently punching me. Even though he was attacking me, I managed to turn him around, talk to my wife, and tell her that since I wasn't the one fighting, there was nothing I could do. When the situation called for it, I was also able to put an end to the physical altercation, i.e., not destroy the house, in the end, I simply didn't think he posed a significant enough threat for me to genuinely want to harm him. Furthermore, I can take quite a bit of damage before it becomes a problem with my build. My wife was also yelling at me because she couldn't believe her husband and son were fighting. Any recommendations besides calling the police? Personally, I'd like to see him tell his son how little the boy means to him and why he's willing to risk 10 years in prison. Despite being asked to calm down a little, Bear in mind that his son is still too young to speak or comprehend words, in the hopes that it would cause his son to open his eyes rather than cause him much pain. Edit. He may have hearing problems, but I doubt it, because he has no trouble hearing us. He is simply an enormous narcissist, and prone to offense. He was given an ADHD diagnosis, but in my view, he might also be bipolar but he would have to be an adult and make and keep the appointments in order to deal with these things. But he refuses to. He doesn't need to yell at us and damage our ears even if he does have hearing problems. You would think that after we pointed that out, he could just make the necessary adjustments and move on. Which is his typical behavior. I can hear the sound of it all. And if I were reading this story from the perspective of someone else, I would vote for jail. However, things are different when someone is this directly involved. That's where I'm looking for the middle ground here. You have reflected your own feelings and hesitations about the possible consequences for your relative. In trying to find alternatives to calling the police, you have indicated your personal beliefs and faith that a hand-to-hand -hand confrontation should not necessarily lead to incarceration. It is understandable that you are conflicted about your next steps and your responsibility to your son. It is hard to imagine what you are going through at this difficult moment and how to choose the right course of action for your entire family. This story is not only about a conflicted relationship, but also about the difficult choices you need to make in this situation. This is a real drama that is incredibly complex and tense. I wish you wisdom and patience in this difficult period, and I hope that you will find a way to resolve this family dispute, which seems to be very important and difficult. The next story is Very Bad HOA. The HOA in our neighborhood was so bold that it was almost unbelievably outrageous. I took care to steer clear of any properties with HOA entanglements when I purchased my home. I wanted to be free to paint my house any color I wanted, 
to design my own landscape, and most of all, to use my backyard grill to make my signature smoked ribs. One bright Saturday afternoon was the first indication of trouble. Just as I was lighting my grill, a man in khakis and a clean polo shirt stepped out from the edge of my yard. He identified himself as HOA board member Rick. Knowing full well that I was not a member of any HOA, I laughed to myself. I did, however, listen to him and was courteous. Rick asserted that the HOA owned 50.01% of my property, giving them the right to impose their rules, which included a ban on outdoor cooking, on me. Conveniently, Rick didn't have these records with him when I asked to see them. He said he would deliver them by the following day. Knowing he was wrong, I let him go, amused and a little annoyed. I produced my original purchase documents and property deed, which unequivocally demonstrated my lack of HOA membership. Rick came back the following day with a stack of papers, none of which mentioned my specific property and didn't bear my signature. He insisted they had legal standing when I brought this to his attention. Things got out of hand very quickly. I began receiving fines from the HOA, each one more absurd than the last. They said I owed them for everything, including unpermitted flower beds and untrimmed hedges. Property liens and lawsuit threats were attached to every fine. I made the decision to give this some serious thought. I retained the services of a property dispute lawyer. He gave me the reassurance that I didn't need to worry about after looking over my paperwork and the HOA's claims. We demanded that the HOA stop harassing us and withdraw their claims against my property in a cease and desist order that we filed. In response, the HOA went all in. They started notifying my neighbors in writing about my alleged infractions and advising them to stay away from me. They even went so far as to disseminate tales about me being a disruptive and dangerous influence on the neighborhood. I maintained my composure and recorded every exchange. I set up security cameras to record all phone calls and any visits from HOA members. I put together a thorough case against them with the help of my attorney, claiming unlawful property claims, harassment, and defamation. The real plot twist emerged when we learned that Linda, the president of the HOA, had been falsifying paperwork and redrawing property lines to their advantage. She had falsified documents to give the impression that the HOA controlled the neighborhood more than it actually did. The last straw in their case was this revelation. We presented the case in court with unquestionable proof of their wrongdoing. The HOA's flagrant disrespect for legal procedures and property rights did not sit well with the judge. As my lawyer showed Linda the fake documents and described how she had tricked not just me, but the whole neighborhood, Linda's face went pale. The decision came down hard and fast. For harassment and defamation, the HOA was mandated to pay significant damages. Linda was charged with fraud and forgery. In order to pay the fines and attorney fees, the HOA was dissolved and their assets were liquidated. In a last bit of revenge, the judge gave me the go-ahead to throw a neighborhood cookout once a month for the following year. To demonstrate that there were no ill will among my neighbors, I made sure to invite everyone, even those who had sided with the HOA. The majority arrived, excited to savor the now famous smoked ribs. My backyard turned into a hub of celebration and harmony. The dictatorial HOA's fall from grace served as a lesson in corruption and power. I celebrated my win for everyone who had ever been harmed by an overzealous HOA, not just for myself. No one would ever tell me what I could or could not do on my property again. It was all mine. Regarding Rick and Linda, their reputations were destroyed, and they vanished into obscurity. After justice was done, I could finally enjoy my backyard in peace, free from the talons of a rogue HOA and with the smell of barbecue filling the air. The next story is airport rental car desks struggle with missed flights and unruly passengers. I work in a tiny airport for a car rental company. The TSA acts as a partition between the airport's entrance and the gate where passengers board the aircraft. So the airport is essentially one room. The rental car company's large front desk bears the name of the business. Whether they are arriving to board a plane or departing from an aircraft, 
it is also the first thing that visitors see when they arrive at the airport. I'm used to people thinking that, despite the big letters on the desk and the large yellow wall behind me, we are an all-knowing airport information booth. Most of the time, I can easily respond to inquiries from people seeking information, such as when does Alaska Airlines open, how do I park, where is TSA, etc., and since the airport is just one room and all it would take for someone to get to the correct location is five steps in any direction, all the questions are a little annoying, but that's life in the real world. It's also important to note that airlines are required by FAA regulation to close 40 minutes before departure. You won't be able to get a boarding pass or check in for your flight after that time, and that applies to every system. Electronic kiosks or your phone cannot be used to check in if you have less than 40 minutes before departure. To be clear, staffing concerns have nothing to do with this. Rather, Homeland Security is the reason behind it. All employees and passengers are required to exit the airport at the 40-minute mark and remain there until the flight takes off. These rules are either less well-known or of little concern at larger airports, because passing through security typically leaves travelers with an hour or two to spare before their flight. Even though Alaska Airlines emails you to let you know to come in two hours before your flight, people frequently arrive at our little hole in the wall airport with less than 40 minutes until their flight because TSA takes less than five minutes to get through. After discussing all of that, let's get to the IDWHL moment itself. A client came up to pick up his rental car from my desk. After going over all the paperwork, I send him off. A few days later, he returns to make his flight and turn in his car. Our clients are typically very seasoned travelers who have meticulously planned every aspect of their trips. The customer then hands me the rental keys and a printed copy of the receipt. I inform him that Alaska Airlines is about to close and advise him to get his boarding pass and check his bag as soon as possible. The customer gives a grunt and moves on. I'm getting ready for the customers arriving on the next flight because I've completed my portion. I overhear an agent from Alaska utter the cliched, five minutes until the desk closes. I continue to do what I do. These days, three people typically staff my booth, but I was the only one working that day because of some intricate staffing issues that are not worth discussing. Not to mention that it was one of our busier days. I was working alone, covering for three people, and trying to prepare all the cars I needed. I see the customer standing at my desk as I enter from my parking lot after finishing the last car I needed to prepare, the one the customer just returned. He's clearly upset that I wasn't at the desk all the time because he's talking on the phone, which makes it difficult to talk to him and find out what he needs. This is how the whole conversation unfolds. Customer. Yeah, I can't find anyone that effing works here. Speaking to the phone, places the itinerary on the desk that is in front of my client to me. Please check me in. Me. I apologize, sir, but I'm not employed by the airlines. All I do is rent cars. Customer. Calling. Wait a minute. She's being silly. To myself. Are you saying you are unable to check me in? Don't you work for the airport? Me. I work at the airport, yes, but I'm not employed by the airlines. Speak with the airlines if you require a boarding pass. Client. Nobody is present. Me. Well... According to FAA regulations, they must close 40 minutes before departure. You will have to wait until after the next flight takes off for them to return. My customers are currently forming a line behind the man working the counter as the inbound flight has landed. However, the man refused to take my word for it. Customer. However, I should be on that plane. Me. Well, then, there isn't much anyone else can do in the absence of a boarding pass. You will have to wait for a representative to return and reschedule you for the subsequent flight. Customer. All right. Get one for me and go to the back. I'll hold out. Returns to speaking with the person on the phone that has been in his ear the entire time. Me. I apologize, sir. The airlines in my booth are entirely unrelated. I can't possibly take someone by the back. The caller said, sorry, hold on. Nobody seems to be able to do their work around here. To me. How am I going to make my flight if you can't find anyone? Me. I'm sorry, but it looks like you missed it. You'll have to either call the 800 number on their podium or wait for an Alaskan agent to return and reschedule. Cust. This is absolutely absurd. Return my effing car to me. 
I'll just take my own car to the other airport. Me. Regretfully, I'm also unable to accomplish that. I continue by explaining that I was forced to fulfill my reservations in the order that they were received and that I was not able to send a car in a one-way manner. As a result, everyone behind him was backed up in line to get their cars first. But I could take care of every customer in line and go out and clean a car to get him where he was going if he was willing to wait an hour. That idea about missing his connecting flight if he waited an hour didn't sit well with him either. He would still miss his connecting flight because the drive to his next destination would take three hours. Cussed. Two ways to go about this. Either you or someone else can check me in for this flight right now. For five more minutes, we keep going back and forth about how I can't help him and that he wouldn't go until I took action. The patrons behind him become agitated at this point. They just want to hop in their rental cars and head to their hotels at 7 p.m. Custom, giving me his phone, please tell my boss why I can't board this plane. Me, I just don't work for the airlines, so I'm not refusing to let you on. I then answer the phone and inform his supervisor of the circumstances. Me, regretfully, the employee was unable to make their flight. It made no difference that I told him to check in, that the airlines had issued announcements, or that this issue would have arisen at any other airport. His phone preoccupied him more than his travel itinerary. I ended the call, gave the phone back to him, and steered him in the direction of the airline desk, where he sobbed and tried to board the already taken off flight for the next 30 minutes. The next flight wasn't until 5 a.m. the following day. Luckily, everyone else in line treated me incredibly well. They must have heard the man being so impolite, I believe. It's incredible how skillfully you handled the situation with a dissatisfied client who, instead of taking responsibility for his actions, tried to blame you and others for his problems. It is also important to note how you try to explain to the customer the rules and restrictions related to the check-in time. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, comment.